Welcome to Excel 2010 video number 31. Hey, if you want to download this workbook, Excel 2010 Statistics Chapter 3, click on the link below the video. Wow, in this video we got to talk about Z-score. Now, last video we talked all about variation, but specifically we talked about standard deviation. Now, standard deviation and mean go together. And let's see, look at an example here. You, let's say on your calculus test you got 78 and the mean for this calculus test was 73. The standard deviation was 3, right? So, did you do better? Who did better, you or your sister? So here's you, here's your sister. Your sister comes home and says, hey, uh, actually this one here, hey, I got 93 on my history test. And you said, yeah, but I got 78, I did better than you. She says, no way, I got 93. Well, if we know the mean and the standard deviation compared to the average score for this history class 96 and the average score for this calculus test, we can really see who did, did better. We can already see right here, um, 78 is well above average here, 93, oh, it's below average. Ah, but we can do a specific calculation called a z-score where we use a mean and a standard deviation. So here's the history test, mean 96, here's the history test, standard deviation 3, 73 for calculus and 3 here. So let's calculate what's called a z-score. It's the, uh, the x value, the particular value, minus our x-bar divided by standard deviation. Okay, so equals, open parentheses, oh yeah, our score minus the average. Well, we can already see this is going to be a positive, right? Because we're above average. Now, let's take that deviation and divide it by the standard deviation. This is an amazing calculation that tells you how many standard deviations above or below the mean you are. Now we can kind of eye this one, right? 3, 73. If I added 3 to it and to go up, that would be 76. That would be one standard deviation above. From 6 to 8 is almost, you know, to two standard deviations. So you did pretty well. Well above average, and more specifically you say I did 1.67 standard deviations above the mean. So the Z is always going to tell us how many standard deviations above or below the mean. Now let's do your sister's history score calculation. I'm going to say equal the particular x minus the mean, and I forgot I have to put that in parentheses because we have to force that subtraction to come before division. Now this one we can clearly I. If 96 is the average, the mean, and your score is 93 and the standard deviation 3, you did exactly one standard deviation below, right? So you're below average in this particular test. And of course we get negative 1. So the correct way to interpret Z is number of standard deviations above or below, in this case minus 1 standard deviation below the mean. This is a very useful measure. It is the number of standard deviations above or below, but it can be interpreted as a measure of relative location um, of the item in the data set. Now there's also a standardized function. I tend to like to do the calculation here because it, it clearly shows you the, the meaning of this, right? How many standard deviations above or below, but you can use your standardized. And there's an x. That's our particular x, comma, and our mean. There's our mean, standard deviation. And now I can copy this. These are all relative cell references. So I can copy this and paste this right here because these numbers are in the same relative position. Now let's do another example right here. Um, let's say Joe. Joe's score was 80. Sorry, um, on the calculus test was 73. Let's find out what the Z score is for Joe. Equals, open parentheses, the particular value minus 
the mean, you can already see what is the z. It is zero. This means zero deviation from the average score, our mean calculation. But we'll go ahead and finish this off, divided by our uh, standard deviation. So z means, boom, you're exactly right on the mean. This person's, um, so you, your calculus score well above the mean, uh, your sister <laughs> a whole standard deviation below. Now, actually, there are some notes up here. In particular, when z is greater than 0, you know the actual value is greater than the mean. When z is less than 0, we know the x value is less than the mean. And when it's right on, the value equals the mean. Now, we want to look at two important applications of z-score and of how values f uh, fit into the distribution. We're going to go over to the sheet Chebyshev, and I, I never can pronounce it right. Uh, I, let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, Russian mathemat mathematician Chebyshev. I know I'm not saying it right, but well, th this theorem he came up with is quite amazing. Allows us to make statements about the proportion of data values that must be within a specified number of standard deviations, right? So if we say specified number, that means is it within one standard deviation, two standard deviations of the mean? For example, and with this theorem, we'll be able to have make statements like 82% of the students uh, must have a test score between 58 and 82. Now here's our rule. Let's look at a slight interpretation of the rule, and then we'll come up and look at the math for it. Uh, the real power of this theorem is it applies to any data set regardless of the shape of the distribution. In just a moment, we're going to learn the normal or empirical rule that's for bell-shaped distributions. But not all distributions are bell-shaped, that's for sure. So that's where this rule comes in. We can say things like at least 75% of the data values must lie within a z-score of two standard deviations. And it's quite easy. We'll do this in just a moment. We'll calculate, given our sample mean of 75 and a standard deviation of 5, we can easily figure out, add 2 times 5 to this and subtract it. And that'll give us our upper and lower values. And then we can say between those two values, 75% of the values should occur. 89% within three standard deviations, 94% within four standard deviations. So let's go ahead. And in just a moment, we'll use this rule. This is to find the actual proportion given a z. But let's just um, calculate our first example, OK? We want to calculate an upper and a lower. So for the upper, I'm just going to, hey, our mean plus standard deviation times R2. Enter. 85. So that's the, the up. Oops, that'll be the subtraction. We'll subtract this. That means just 5 times 2, right? That's the lower end. And then the upper end will be, hey, 75 plus standard deviation times 2, right? And so you say at least 75% of the values must lie between uh, 65 and 85. This is plus or minus two standard deviations. Similarly, we could do our calculation here. Subtract standard deviation times 3. So 60 is our lower, and our upper is going to be, hey, the x bar plus our standard deviation times our three standard deviation. And so there it is. At least 89% of the values will lie between 60 and 90. So up here, we just had kind of our rule, our straight rule. Here, we calculated the upper and lower values, given an x bar and a standard deviation. So quite, quite powerful, just from x bar, standard deviation, and uh, a little math here, we can calculate an upper and lower value for a particular distribution. And of course, we could do it for four standard deviations here. What's the upper and lower? I'm going to say that minus r5 times r4, so 55, and then 75 plus our standard deviation 
times 4. So at least 94% of the values will lie between 55 and 95 standard deviations. Now in this example we, we had the X bar and sample standard deviation and we just calculated uh, two standard deviations and we calculated the lower and upper. But let's take this one step further. Scroll down here. So here we calculated the two ends, the lower and the upper. Down here we want to start with a lower and an upper. We want to calculate our Z. Again, here's 67 and 83. Same X bar and standard deviation. Here we calculated 65 and 85, but what about between 67 and 83? It's not quite, you know, a, a an integer here, so we have to calculate our z first, and then we'll learn how to calculate the proportion. Our z, oh yeah, particular value minus the x bar, and I'm going to lock this one, divided by our sample standard deviation, and lock that one. Okay, so this will give us our z, and there it is. We have lower and upper 1.6. Now we want to figure out the proportion of values that lie between these two. So we got to come up here and here's our rule. At least 1 minus 1 divided by z squared of the values in any data set will be within z standard deviations of the mean, where z is any value greater than 1. Alright, so this is going to give us the proportion and the only input we need is what? a z. So that 1.6, we'll slap it in there and it'll tell us the proportion. So you ready? Equals 1 minus and then 1 divided by our z squared. Now it doesn't matter which z we use because it's going to be squared, right? All right, and the order of operations will work fine here. We don't need any parentheses because guess get what gets done first? Exponents then division, and then that subtraction, which is exactly what we want. And so at least 60.94% of the scores must be between 67 and 83. Now let's look at another example. I'm going to scroll down here just a little bit. All right, according to the theorem, at least what percent of any data set will be within 1.8 standard deviations of the mean. Remember, 1.8 standard deviation just means our z-score. Well, we can f calculate that proportion or percent. Here's our 1.8, which is plug it into our formula, equals 1 minus 1 divided by z squared. So shift 6, caret 2. According to this theorem, at least 69.14 of any data set will be within plus or minus 1.8 standard deviations of the mean. So that's pretty useful theorem. Given a lower and upper, we can calculate some percentage and say within these limits, we're pretty sure that this proportion of uh, numbers will occur. Let's look at another rule, the empirical rule. We're going to come over to the sheet empirical rule. Empirical rule for data having, oh, a bell shaped. Now, before I jump into this rule, I want to actually download a different workbook. I'm going to go over to our website, and you can click on the link below the video too. Uh, the first file we downloaded was uh, Chapter 3. This one says Excel 2010 Statistics Chapter 3, second file. So I want to go ahead and you download that. I'm going to open this up, and sometimes a picture tells a thousand words. Now, just a moment ago, we were talking about proportion of values between an upper and a lower for any shape. But if the distribution, the population distribution, is bell shaped or tends to be bell shaped, then you can use this empirical rule. And what it says is within about three standard deviations, virtually all of the values will occur. Now, let's look at an example here. If we have a population of statistics test scores, which fits the bell curve, and the population mean is 83 mu with a standard deviation of the population sigma of 5, for within three standard deviations, the 
empirical rule says 99% of all the values will lie between 68 and 98. Now, how do we get an exact number like that? Well, again, the rule says three standard deviations. So over here, I took 83 minus 5 times 3. That's the lower end. The upper end, I took, oh, 83 times 3 standard deviations um, times 3 standard deviations times our actual sigma, and that gave us 98. All right, this is a specific example. The general rule is just three standard deviations. 99% of the values in a bell-shaped distribution will lie within plus or minus three standard deviations. So that's the normal rule. This is our specific example here. And you can look down here. There's a 98. There's a 68. So the area under the curve, and actually we don't get to do area under the curve for this type of distribution until chapter 6, I think it is. But the idea is presented here because we're talking about means and standard deviations, right? So within three standard deviations, man, virtually all values will occur. Now, within plus or minus two standard deviation, 95% of the values will occur. So what do we do here? I calculated 73. 73 is just 83 times 2 times 5, 83 minus 2 times 5, 73, 93. So that's the range. So the empirical rule says 95% of the values should lie between 73 and 83. So here's a picture right here. There's our 93 on the upper end and 73. So between those two, that green limit there and that green limit here, everything between here under the curve equals 95%. 68% of the values should lie between plus or minus one standard deviation. And that would between, be between 78 and 88. All right, that's uh, the empirical rule or the normal rule. In this chapter, we're in chapter three, all we're going to be expected to do is, given this rule and the knowledge that we know it's a bell-shaped distribution, be able to calculate a lower and an upper. Let's go back to our other workbook and look at some examples. I'm going to go to the sheet bell one. All right, so. 83 is our mu, our uh, mean for the population, and sigma, standard deviation for the population, is 5. So 68% of the scores lie between what two values? When you see that 68, you automatically say, OK, that's one standard deviation. That's our rule right there. So you say equals, oh, well, it's 83 minus, and this is 1, so I'm just going to minus the standard deviation. The upper value would be 83 plus. And then you can say approximately 68% of the values lie between 78 and 88. Now, 95%, that would be two standard deviations. So we'll do our calculation, this, and then minus standard deviation times 2. The upper, there's our mu, our population mean, plus standard deviation sigma. I'm going to multiply times 2. And so approximately 95% of the values will lie between 73 and 93. Now, what percent of the values lie below a score of 83? Oh, wait a second, 83. Well, here's a little picture here. There's a line. Actually, let's go over to that other workbook. There's a line right down the middle. This is called the bell curve or the normal curve. Or it can be called a symmetrical curl curve. And why is it symmetrical? Because right down the middle, 83, actually, for our example here, has a z of 0, right? Because 83 is exactly the mean. You're exactly average. Right? But everything on this side of the curve is 50%, and everything on this side of the curve is 50%. So everything below the mean of 83 or a z-score of 0 is 50%, and everything above is 50%. So we can, in this question here, what percent of the values lie below a score of 83? Approximately 50% 50, 50 lie below. What percentage of values lie above? Approximately 83%. All right, let's go look at another example. I'm going to go over to Bell 2. 
All right, here we have retail price per gallon. Distribution is bell shaped. And here we have a mean regular gas price per gallon of 260. Standard deviation is 15 cents. These are uh, population numbers. Now we want to go from a lower to an upper, and we want to estimate the proportion or the probability of getting a value between these two. Now here's our empirical rule. Down here, here's our empirical rule. Now in this chapter, we're going to kind of do this in a clunky way. Later in chapter 6, we'll see how to do it with the normal distribution functions, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to realize that the of if it's bell-shaped, um, it's symmetrical, right? Well, if there are 68% between plus 1 standard deviation and minus 1 standard deviation, right, 68%, and it's symmetrical, how about, how about we figure out the probability between exactly 0 standard deviation and minus 1? Or, if it's symmetrical, 0 and plus 1. Well, we're just going to divide by 2. And so for each one of these, now we can kind of piecemeal together. We can figure out between these two, but what if we just wanted to say, hey, between zero standard, the, the actual mean and some upper value, right? Then we could use just half of 34. So from here to the end of the purple is 34, and from here to the end of the purple is 34. For two standard deviations right here, from here to the edge of the green, that's going to be 0.475. All right. So let's see if we can figure this out. We've got to calculate z first. So I'm going to say equals my particular value in parentheses minus my locked with the F4 key, the mean divided by my standard deviation. And I'm going to lock that one too. Oh, $1. I'm going to get rid of the formatting. I have this closed down because uh, let's go to general. And I'm going to drag this down. Okay, you can see all the cell references are working. Let's do the same here, thing here. Actually, you can copy this and paste this right here. It's the same relative position, and those are locked. And I'm going to calculate these down. All right. Now, between minus 1 and 1, well, that one's easy, right? Because it's between there and there. So we just go um, equals 68. And then approximately 68% of the values lie between $2.45 and $2.75. Now what about from $2.30 to $2.75? Well, we got a z of minus 2 and 1. Well, what are we going to do here? That's from there all the way to there. Oh, well, this is symmetrical, right? So we know the distance from here to 1 is going to be our 0.34. And the distance from here down to minus 2 will be this 0.475. So we can simply add these. And so approximately 81.5% of the values lie between 230 and 275. Finally, what about uh, this one right here? We want to find what's the probability of getting a, or what's the proportion or approximately the percentage of values that would be above 275. Well, OK, so that's one standard deviation above, so it's everything this direction. Well, since it's symmetrical, everything this direction is 0.5. And everything from here to here is 0.34. We can simply say equals 0.5 minus R34. Now, why is this all important? Here in chapter uh, 3, we're just seeing this for the first time. But later, we'll see uh, for something like this. If you go out and take a sample, and find a value that's above 275, you can see that the, the chances of getting a value up there are pretty low. Not only that, but if you go out and take a sample and get between 245 and 275, since 68% of the values lie between these two values, then it would be pretty reasonable that that sample was uh, representative of the, the population parameter. All right, so just in an introduction here to the empirical rule. Uh, one last tab we want to look at. Let's do one more example with doing uh, the empirical rule and the theorem that I don't know how to pronounce. 
Uh, okay, so if a distribution of weights for a lattice filling machine are normally distributed, bell shape, with a mean of 13 ounces and a standard deviation of 0.1 ounce, what percentage of values would lie between two standard deviations? And what are the low and high values associated with that, the percentage? All right, well, two standard deviation, we're just going to use the empirical rule 95%. The lower value? Oh, here's our mean minus 2 times our standard deviation. Now I'm going to hit Enter. Actually, I could have, anyway, Enter. So 12.8. 12 so that's below our 13 ounces equals, and this one is 13 plus that times that standard deviation times our number of standard deviations, or z-score. And because the distribution is bell-shaped, we can say that approximately 95% of values should lie between 13.2 ounces and 12.8 ounces. Now, let's do that same example, but let's say we don't know anything about the uh, population distribution, so we don't know if it's bell-shaped. Now, if machines that are filling things usually are tend to be bell-shaped. But let's go ahead and calculate using uh, our theorem here. OK, so our lower value, well, we still do the same thing, equals 13 minus standard deviation times 2 z's. 12.8 is going to give us the same number. Oh, the same number, but we'll have a different um, percentage here. So this one is plus on the upper end, this times this. And actually, we probably should have calculated this. Um, we can do this over here. Equals 1 minus 1 divided by, and we know our standard deviation, right? That caret 2. And so that gives us our 0.75. So we can actually, given a certain number of standard deviations and no knowledge of the shape of the, the distribution, we can calculate our proportion. But this. The difference between these two, comparing and contrast, is here we're using the empirical rule, right? It's bell-shaped, so we can be a, a lot more sure between an upper and lower value. Here we don't know anything about the shape of the distribution, so we are less sure. Our statements about this upper and lower are less sure. We say, well, OK, about 75%, whereas up here we'd say about 95%. All right, um, so we did a lot in this video, mostly centering around z-score and distributions and looking at our empirical rule and our theorem here. All right, see you next video.